Good afternoon and welcome back to Living Room. I'm Chris Welch, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice in much anticipated appearance appeared today before the 911 Commission holding hearings into what possibly could have been done that wasn't done in our nation's internal workings to have prevented 911 and what could have been done better afterwards so that such a tragedy never happens again. And of course, Ms. Rice was the primary uh, target of Richard Clark's assertions that the Bush administration ignored many warnings regarding a possible terrorist strike on U.S. soil prior to 9-1-1-2001. And Ms. Rice's uh, own testimony in public or own comments in public uh, before today have uh, been very contradictory. First she said we didn't know anything about it, and then she said, of course, we were on top of it, we knew everything. So let's find out what the verdict is from our... Uh, distinguished guests who have been watching this very, very carefully as to how Condi's testimony today jived with what Richard Clark said last week and what Condi Rice herself has said in the past. On the telephone with us, we have Larry Bensky, Pacifica National Affairs correspondent, who, of course, anchored Pacifica's broadcast of the hearings live today. Good afternoon to you, Larry. Hi, Chris. Larry is on his cell phone on a train on the way to be picking up his daughter, so the sound quality is going to be iffy. On another line with us, we have Walter Field, who is the CEO and publisher of the North Star Network, which is a news magazine, it looks like to me, online. And he's written several pieces about uh, the Bush administration in general and Condi Rice in particular. And his most recent one, uh, March 25th, was titled, In Our View, Fried Rice. Good afternoon to you, Dr. Fields, Mr. Fields. Good afternoon. I'm very glad you could join us. We also have with us on the telephone Paula Shapiro, uh, whose son, Eric, died in the second building, the second tower on 911. And she is a member of 911 Families for Peaceful Tomorrows. Good afternoon to you, Paula. Good afternoon. Very glad you could take some time with us. Thank so you. let's start with you, Larry. What was your uh, view of what happened today, uh, how our headlines uh, described it as uh, aggressive questioning? What did you think the panel did with Condi, and how did she fare? Well, if that's aggressive questioning, I'm uh, swimming the Potomac right now, and I'm not. Uh, I don't think it was a very aggressive or successful session. And I didn't expect a very aggressive or successful session. What this was, as we said beforehand and afterward, was basically a split-screen event, and the other screen was largely missing. The result of the policies that Condoleezza Wright, and for that matter, Richard Clark and others, have um, tried to implement for years has been visible to us in the last 48 hours, which is a catastrophe in Iran. And uh, the fact that they were uh, trying to split hairs and uh, parse verbs and uh, be polite and footsie-footsie with Condoleezza Rice, who uh, knew quite how to handle that, which is to basically filibuster the answers uh, from questioners she didn't like, and then be all charming and responsive and give self-righteous speeches to the questioners she did like. Uh, I don't think that is anywhere. And uh, I think that uh, the uh, the tragedy of what's going on in Iraq right yes. now, what was underlined to me uh, when Condoleezza Rice uh, was asked a puffball question about this, and said basically, well, we have to have patience as we being rebuild countries around the world. Who the heck is we, and who asked us to do that? And what is our understanding of cultures and uh, structures and traditions, and for that matter, religions and practices around the world, when we're bombing mosques in Iran, and then sitting there on Capitol Hill trying to figure out whether or not these people were clueless about the bombings of 9-11? Uh, yeah, they were tied up in a lot of bureaucratic nonsense, Basically, uh, it was bureaucratic nonsense because they had a political agenda, which is to differentiate themselves from the Clinton people, who they thought uh, were inadequate on various levels. And so they wouldn't pay attention to even the good things that the Clinton people did as far as trying to develop intelligence. And uh, there they were. I think Condoleezza Rice today was basically uh, predictably uh, defensive and uh, lecturing, and uh, she added absolutely nothing. Uh, to advancing the inquiry about uh, what happened on September 11th. Well, bottom line, what do you think? How do you think she came out image-wise? Did she successfully uh, retort to all of Richard Clark's very damaging accusations to herself and the Bush administration? I think she took on Richard Clark exactly once directly during the entire three hours. Uh, 
I, I don't. I, that was a subject of what was going on. The Clark versus Condi. He said, she said. Uh, much more important, of course, was uh, what the Bush administration, how it was structuring itself to deal with one of the basic uh, causes of governance, and the reasons for governance, which is protecting its citizens. And uh, on that uh, score today, I think she uh, wound up uh, talking about a lot of uh, obfuscating bureaucratic nonsense. Well. We have a problem here with agencies that don't talk to each other and people on different levels. And, you know, what we needed to do is restructure. Uh, bottom line is she took a committee out of action, which had met regularly, however effectively, is up, to, up for debate, during the Clinton administration, the so-called Principles Committee. And when Richard Clark wanted it to meet back in January of 2001, it actually didn't meet till September. And to say that uh, it doesn't matter when the heads of all these agencies are in the room, nonsense. When the heads of all their agencies are in the room, they also have to claim responsibility and task for action. When you have fourth and fifth levels under secretaries, which is what she was content to, content to deal with, uh, you get what you got, which is a bunch of excuses and CYA memos afterwards. Larry Bensky on a cell phone somewhere on his way to Philadelphia. On the other line with us from, uh, where are you exactly, Walter Field? I am in northern New Jersey. All right. Uh, Walter Field, CEO and publisher of the NorthStarNetwork.com. I mentioned that uh, one of the pieces in a recent uh, online edition of the North Star News Media's uh, North Star Network newsletter, in our view, fried rice, and you say that... Uh, Mr. Clark's assertions, given where he has served in many administrations, he says when you say when he names names, this country should listen. And you say that Condoleezza Rice is the individual whose hands are most stained by Mr. Clark's accusations. Uh, what did you think of uh, Condi's appearance today? Well, you know, I think it was a travesty. I think you had the National Security Advisor uh, for the United States government come before a commission under oath and basically say that structural and systemic problems within government prevented this administration from being prepared to avert a terrorist strike on this country. I thought that was an amazing admission of incompetence, that here you had a White House that did have some specific information, uh, in spite of Dr. Rice's assertion that there were just generalities or historical references and memos. There was specific information that even Mr. Clark had provided suggesting that there was a pending terrorist strike um, of cataclysmic proportion um, waiting for the United States uh, on U.S. territory. And this White House chose to uh, actually ignore those warnings. So for Ms. Rice to come before this commission today and to suggest that there was no direct information provided this administration of a possible strike of the magnitude of September 11, 2001, I think was pretty incredible. And the fact that I think most telling is the fact that she did not, uh, except for the one occasion that was mentioned, take on Richard Clark's testimony. And to me, that shows a White House that understands that it was caught. She actually said more in television appearances in the last few weeks than she said before this commission this morning. Mm -hmm. And what of what she did say in front of t in television appearances, were there contradictions as there are uh, earlier in her comments in uh, 19, in 2002, she said the, well, we didn't know that there were any serious uh, threats, and she and uh, Mr. Bush both have been saying in public that, gosh, we had no idea they'd use planes. And now, of course, she's she's changing her tune. Well, they're trying to they're trying to have it both ways. They're trying to say, um, yes, we fully were cognizant of the fact that terrorism was going to be an issue, but no, we didn't know about any pending terrorist attacks. You know, mind you, we had already had the first bombing of the World Trade Center. We had the attack on the USS Cole. How much more warning do you need? And you had an outgoing administration that is telling you Al Qaeda should be a priority. I don't know how much more warning that they needed. I mean, we wrote a piece today that's up on our website that basically says, you know, according to Dr. Rice, they actually needed the, the date, you know, the time, the hour of the event before they were going to take action. Right, and which airline? That's right. <laughs> You're listening to Walter Fields, the CEO and publisher of the North Star Network. And when you go online, go to the Northstarnetwork, all one word, uh, dot com.
uh, for very interesting information. And what did you think, how did you think the uh, panel treated her? I, I thought for the most part they were softball pitches. I was really surprised that, number one, uh, there wasn't more aggressive questioning of Dr. Rice, given Mr. Clark's testimony. I was very shocked that no one really raised the issue of Iraq and why this administration uh, instructed their staffers to look for a connection between the bombing on September 11th and Saddam Hussein's bath party. Um, I was just amazed that they basically gave Dr. Rice a pass. And I think it, it, it's all the more reason why I think the public really has to raise their voices and demand that certain documents become declassified because I don't think we will ever get to the truth if we depend upon the White House to tell it. Mm -hmm. uh, Walter Fields, our guest on the telephone, uh, wrote a column for the record out of the New Jersey uh, Daily Paper for uh, several years, contributing editor to the New Jersey, New Jersey Reporter, the Public Affairs Monthly Magazine there. He's won several awards for his writing. He is also one of the original contributors in the MSNBC cable news channel. He's appeared on Hardball with Chris Matthews, The O'Reilly Factor, no less, Hannity and Combs. My goodness. <laughs> there goes the neighborhood and the Tavis Smiley Show among many other things. He's done a great deal of world traveling and uh, writes a lot of stuff that is worth paying attention to on the North Star News Network dot com. Let's turn to Paula Shapiro, also on the phone with us with 911 Families for pe for Peaceful Tomorrows. Good afternoon to you, Paula. What what did you think of these uh, hearings today and Condoleezza Rice's appearance? Well, I was not particularly surprised by her demeanor and her ability to send questions. Um, I did find it somewhat disingenuous, more than somewhat disingenuous, <clears throat> that she thanked the families for, you know, persevering with the commission because clearly the administration has you know, thwarted it whenever possible, and, and I think that they're very allowing her to speak today was a political move as opposed to, you know, any pursuit of truth. Um, she did not say anything that particularly surprised me. Um, I, too, was somewhat questioned by the gentler nature of, uh, of the questions that were being asked. Um... You know, I, I, but I do think that a major piece of the problem is was the systemic bureauc bureaucratic issues, and I've worked in bureaucracies, and I understand, you know, the whole non-communication from one end to the other end, and that, and uh, a statement that was made about re when the Patriot Act comes up again in 2005. Um, that a lot of the information that they've subsequently been able to get has been a result of it. I, my hope is that when that Patriot Act comes up again, each and every segment of it will be looked at carefully, and people will carefully weigh where we're giving up our freedoms for what I believe is an illusion of security anyway, um, and that the Commission will have something helpful to contribute in that direction. Paula Shapiro's uh, son, Eric, died in 911, and the families of the victims of 911 have, as you've hinted here, Paula, been very effective and very active in trying to get the truth about what happened and what didn't happen and what should have happened uh, to prevent 911 from happening and to have uh, make sure that it never happens again. And one of the the consistent complaints has been that, you know, there's never even been an apology. And Richard Clark, in a very moving moment in his appearance, opened his remarks by apologizing. And Condi Rice, as you just now hinted, did say something vaguely... Oh, I don't know what if you would call it apologetic, but is is an apology uh, one of the things that uh, the families want? I, you know, I can't speak for the families any more than you know I can speak for any other group. Um, it it is not a something that I wanted. Did I feel moved by Mr. Clark's statement? Absolutely. Did I feel it was genuine? Absolutely. Um, was I cognizant of the fact that he is the only person of any administration attached to this government who has had the common courtesy to say that? Absolutely. Um, would Condi Rice saying, gee, I'm sorry that, you know, which I don't think she'd ever say that, you know, we messed it up and, and this happened, make me feel better? I don't think so, because the issues that I see with this administration and their total attachment to secrecy, you know, precludes 
them being able to see the whole picture from, you know, from the way I look at the world. I, I'm a social worker, so I sort of look at the world from a social worker way. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and it's not that, I, you know, I would feel better if, you know, Clinton and Bush and Cheney at all came up and said, gee, we're sorry it happened. No. Um, I think had they been more forthcoming and cooperative with the commission, its formation and, it, and its work, that would have been of significance to me. Paula Shapiro, we're going to turn to Larry Bensky because I have a feeling we're going to have to say goodbye to him uh, because his phone is going to cut out. Are you still there, Larry? Yes, I'm back. Okay, good. Well, let me uh, just ask you, In we're going to be returning to these hearings uh, next week, and for folks who are interested, you can go to www.kpfa.org to get all of Condi Rice's testimony. It's archived there as all of Pacifica, all of the programs that we have on the air are, www.kpfa.org. And you'll be back in the saddle uh, next uh, Tuesday and Wednesday when I guess uh, Ashcroft is scheduled to appear. What do you think... What impact is these hearings and and uh, going to have on Bush's chances for re-election? That seems to be the bottom line to lots of folks. Yeah, well, it's it's very political in that sense, of course. Uh, those who say, well, we shouldn't put politics into this uh, are not looking at where the hearings are being held and when they're being held. I mean, they are on Capitol Hill in the largest hearing room available on Capitol Hill. Uh, people are coming from uh, all over the East Coast, especially the survivors' families. Uh, people are seeing them on television. Today's were nationally broadcast on the networks. It isn't just Pacifica that's broadcasting mm-hmm. them right now, although probably next week it'll go back to being mostly us. But um, th- there is a very serious possibility of impact because uh, as the public uh, indicates less and less satisfaction with uh, George W. Bush and his administration's ability to deal with issues of public safety and international uh, relations, uh, such as the disastrous uh, slaughter basically now going on in Iraq where they're bombing mosques in order to save people. Uh, and if you pair that up with, with today's obvious uh, major text in my mind, which is, as uh, your other guest has said, uh, Condoleezza Rice uh, getting up there and saying, well, uh, gee, uh, basically we couldn't do our job, the one you elected us to, because we were too busy figuring out how to organize ourselves for 233 days. Uh, you got to be ready on day one to protect the people that you're sworn to protect. And uh, they weren't ready on day 233. So uh, I think it may have a significant impact, but only, of course, if the Democrats and Kerry are able to play this properly. If it's seen as just politics and opportunism, uh, then I think one of the things you may see here, and people should watch out for this, is the same halo effect that redounded around Bill Clinton. The more his enemies piled up so-called evidence of his moral turpitude and what he did or didn't do with uh, an intern in the White House, uh, the more his poll ratings went up because people thought, well, this is not serious and this is just politics and people just attacking him. Hmm. This is seen as merely John Kerry and the Democrats attacking George W. Bush uh, because they're on the other side and they don't have substantive ways of engaging the serious question of world safety and uh, differences among nations, the differences inside nations. Um, I don't think George W. Bush will be as hurt as so many people assume he w- would be and should be, of course, because of the lies the administration has told and the admitted incompetence that uh, Condoleezza Rice uh, basically swore to today. Well, do you not think that some of the, as you mentioned, halo effect around Bill had to do with, I mean, they, they were talking about a stain on a blue dress and maybe a blowjob in the Oval Office. You know what I'm saying? They were not talking about the Twin Towers going down, the attack on the Pentagon, and the subsequent conflagration in Iraq. It's sort of a different level. Or do you think the public won't really notice that? Well, I can tell you're probably not a practicing evangelical Christian, Chris. Hmm. <laughs> Because of BJ in the Oval Office to them. I have drifted, as Mae West said. It's just as important <laughs> as the Twin Towers coming down. I mean, it's ludicrous for those of us who don't see things that way. But there are plenty of people who see things the other way. And they form a hardcore support for George W. Bush. Now, it's not monolithic, and it's not as if it can't crack. Uh, I think what's happening today on the split screen with Fallujah and Iraq on one hand, mm. and the complete coming apart of all the rhetoric about the United States uh, mission in Iraq, uh, so-called. And on the other hand, uh, Condoleezza Rice sitting up there primly and firmly uh, speaking bureaucratese uh, to no special uh, effect. Uh, I think those twin screens are, are very, very damaging to George W. Bush, but please remember this is April, the election's in November. 
Mm. Uh, Larry Bensky, Pacifica National Affairs correspondent, who in fact will be anchoring the hearings next Tuesday and Wednesday as well. And, where that, the, and that, by the way, Chris, is when the Patriot Act and its renewal and all of that will come up because the future mm. witness the first day is John Ashcroft. Right. And uh, it will be very interesting to see if they uh, uh, go at that because, as, as your, one of your other guests is saying, mm-hmm. one of the main cancers upon this government, and it's not just Bush administration, is secrecy. I mean, they can't even declassify memos. The title of the memo today finally came out. Right, about right. The threat of Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. And Condoleezza Rice, when she was finally jammed, and she hates, of course, being asked any questions she actually has to answer and can't make a little speech about. She was finally jammed. Well, why don't you declassify these? She says, well, I think you know the considerations of the executive office about declassification. That's all complete nonsense. This is the people's business. This is about protecting us from serious physical threats. And if we're too uh, unsophisticated and too untrustworthy to understand our own government, well, then we get what we get. Well, I wonder if as, as other people besides me and you will see it as covering their butts as opposed to uh, keeping the nation safe. Um, one thing that you just mentioned, and you have mentioned ongoingly today and elsewhere, and I'm very grateful for that, and did not come up today in Condoleezza Rice's testimony, as you point out, is what's going on in Iraq. And Walter Fields has a piece uh, in the North Star Network News, Hate American Style, Iraq Trees Bearing Strange Fruit. And, Walter, you you say at the end of this, rather than point to Mogadishu when referring to the Fallujah attack, point to Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, etc. What, in your view, is the connection there? Well, I think the connection is the form of violence that took place against those four uh, civilian contractors who were actually security personnel, private security personnel. And I don't think Mm -hmm. we should miss that point because I think there's a real connection there between what happened to them um, and who they are. You know, I think that our country, unfortunately, never takes responsibility for the problems it has caused in the world. And I think much of the world looks at the United States and looks at us as hypocrites. Because on the one hand, we express outrage over what happened um, in that attack. Um, but we don't talk about what we did in our own country. Just the same way we use the term Islamic extremists. Well, we don't talk about, and you know, from the African American perspective, there were Christian extremists who attempted to do bodily harm to black Americans in this country. So I think, you know, part of my, my issue with uh, the Bush administration and, and has been with a number of administrations is that we need to own up to our own mess, to our own skeletons in our closet before we begin to try to police the world. What we're seeing unfold, you know, in Iraq is really horrendous. And I think one of the real problems here is that we're not going to be able to address this electorally, which I think is the ultimate you know, decision maker removing George Bush from office, unless we can convince a subset of Republican voters that there has been an egregious crime committed against the American people in the way this administration has proceeded. One of the real problems is that you have a core group of true believers that are going to support this president no matter what. I'm hopeful that those of us who see the light will be able to convince Republicans who will continue to support this president that just like what transpired during the next few years, there comes a time when you have to devoid yourself of party you know, affiliation and party loyalty and stand up as a citizen and say wrong is wrong and hold your government accountable to allow them to continue to hide behind documents, to allow them to continue to classify documents, I think, you know, is a betrayal of the American public. And until all of us begin to pressure many Republican legislators on Capitol Hill, I don't think we're going to see a change, and this will all go for naught, and this president will be reelected. Hmm. Um, I wonder, uh, you are talking, of course, about uh, Condoleezza Rice, who is the most powerful, arguably the most powerful African-American woman in the world, <laughs> or African woman in the world. She's she's up there, the National mm-hmm. Security Advisor. And, of course, then there is Colin Powell, the Secretary of State of the United States of America. It's uh, The Bush administration has really put African-Americans uh, in positions of great power. Well, and well, when you say that we should uh, forego party loyalty and vote for what's right, 
lots of folks were saying that uh, in the case of Clarence Thomas, for instance, that African Americans have to stand for African Americans. Well, you know, if I could use a Superman reference, it's sort of a bizarro <laughs> image that, yes, they're African Americans, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, number one, they should be supported simply because they're African Americans, because I think we have to look at the greater policy implications of their presence in this administration. The Republican Party has skillfully figured out how to use race as a weapon. They did it with Clarence Thomas. They're doing it with Condoleezza Rice and with Colin Powell. That is, position blacks in prominent places, even though their their policy making may be against the interests of African Americans, but then daring African Americans to take them on, because then, in fact, you become a racist yourself. And we saw this during the Clarence Thomas hearings, when any black who criticized Clarence Thomas was being racist, where Clarence Thomas himself said he was, you know, the victim of a high-tech lynching. So, you know, in my mind, people like Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell have really gotten a free ride because there's been this fear to take them on, even from black leadership, simply because they're black. And I'm suggesting to people, get over it. These people are enacting policies that are against the interest of all of us and African Americans. And I think we have to hold their feet to the fire, and in many respects, hold their feet to the hot fire, you know, to an even greater degree. Condoleezza Rice, of anybody, should know the importance of telling the truth, considering the fact that she was born in Birmingham, Alabama, mm. a city known as Bombingham, that mm. one of her childhood friends was one of the four little girls who was killed in a 16th Street Baptist uh. church. If Anybody should be held accountable to tell the truth is Condoleezza Rice. Mm. Walter Rice, CEO and publisher of the North Star Network dot com. I'd like to invite listeners to call in with questions at five one zero eight four eight four four two five five one zero eight four eight four four two five for questions for our guests. And uh, while you folks are dialing, I'm going to turn to Paula Shapiro, uh, one of whose son Eric died in the second tower on 911, member of 911 Families for Peaceful Tomorrows. Uh, the families as this group have uh, been following very closely, I think, the uh, 911 commissions, and there was a great skepticism that there would be any truly independent or transparent, re- transparent report coming out of this agency, given the way it was designed and, and the fact that the uh, executive director is a close associate, one of the closest colleagues of Condi Rice, with whom she wrote na- national security position papers, uh, sort of a conflict of interest. So, given all of that, Paula, what can come out of this that might uh, benefit the public at large, and in particular, give some oh hope to the families for truth ultimately coming out? Um, can I just please say amen to everything the gentleman before me just said? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, it's wonderful to actually hear it said, as opposed to only in my mind. Um, before I answer your question, I, 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 and a part, and a lot of it has to do with this concept of safety. Before September 11th happened, I knew it was going to happen based on how we have been in the world. And I am not a great follower of politics, not until the last couple of years, and even then it's sporadic. Um, I did not know it was going to be September 11th. I did not know I was going to lose my child. Mm. But I knew that we could not be the way we were in the world and not have some repercussions you know, occur as a result of it. And I did not think that we were ever impervious to, you know, to, to, to an attack. Um, what can come out of this? Um, hopefully what can come out of it is some places where things can be fixed. Do I think we're going to hear the ultimate truth that's going to ultimately, you know, make everything safer eventually? No, because I don't think it's an ultimate truth. I think it's a lot, a lot, a lot of little pieces. Some of it is political, some of it is bureaucratic, some of it is systemic. A lot of it is that you're dealing with politicians, and for better or for worse, I was raised 60-some-odd years in a household where you don't believe politicians. There are a few <laughs> states, in, you know, in the government, but they are, I could probably count them on the fingers of maybe two hands. Um, mm. Half of them need to be reelected every two years, so pardon me if they don't stay stationary on a point. And, um, you know, the rest of them, you know, are serving whatever masters they're serving. So, I, you know, I, I don't know that I had an expectation of an ultimate answer. I don't think there is an ultimate answer. I think this happened because of how we have been in the world. I don't think we have changed that stance 
ethically, morally, or with any integrity. And I think until we do, you know, admit to what we've done in Central America, in, uh, you know, in, in Southeast Asia, mm. in every place that we've intervened where we should not have, because it was expedient for whatever the government thought needed to be expedient at that moment, I don't think it's going to change. Mm. We have no integrity. I mean, and and that means that we have no integrity as as an ethic, and also that we have no integrity as in a surrounding to protect us. Mm. Paula Shapiro, one of the uh, members of Peaceful Tomorrow's nine one one families for P- September eleventh families for Peaceful Tomorrow's. Our first caller on the line at five one zero eight four eight four four two five to talk to Walter Fields, Larry Bensky, or Paula Shapiro is Paul in Livermore. Welcome, Paul. Hi. And thank you, Larry, for uh, doing that for the world, really. I just found out Larry's cell phone went out, so. <laughs> but I'll, I'll convey your thanks. <laughs> yeah, that's what, I, that's what I'm, I'm thanking KPFA as well as Larry. And uh, Walter, is it? Yes, yeah. Walter Fields. Yeah, geez, what a... After listening to Condoleezza Rice this morning, you are a breath of fresh air. And as a pathological, self-proclaimed pathological liar, she, she's not all that great. Well, I, I think what you saw was someone who was coached extremely well. And you have to remember, Connolly the Rice was really um, shepherded um, into government by the Bush family. Uh, she came up through the ranks, you know, under this president's father. So she is a member of the family. And I think the problem that we see is that we have someone who has been positioned and someone who has admitted that she had no knowledge of the Middle East. She had no knowledge of this region. I mean, she was a, an expert on the Soviet Union, and mm-hmm. she came into the White House with that Cold War perspective. Mm. This was an administration that was not prepared at all to deal with this issue of global terrorism. And while they only had 233 days, I think Larry was absolutely right. Everyone knows that when you win an election and you enter the White House, you have to be prepared on day one for action. You can't wait and say, give us time. There is no time when you are the President of the United States. You have to be prepared on day one. So to use that excuse that we were only in office for 233 days, so therefore we didn't have time to formulate policy, Mm -mm. what is the excuse the next time it happens? Mm -mm -mm. All right. Thank you for that call, Paul. 510-844-425. We go to Red in Oakland, I believe. Welcome to the living room. Hi. Thank you. Um, I also want to uh, thank Pacifica and and everything for uh, the coverage you guys have been giving this um, hearing, and I put that in quotes. Uh, My comment is that um, both the mainstream, the White House, and even even the uh, alternative media seem to be focusing, and these hearings seem to be focusing on the blundering of the White House, uh, the mistakes and the miscommunications, and... um, all sort of the uh, justifications for allowing this event to have happened. And, and as I've been paying attention to these hearings, and even Richard Clark, um, it strikes me that what is going on are justifications to uh, the uh, Homeland Security Act and the Patriot Act and all that. And, and you know, the, they're saying that, you know, the FBI didn't coordinate with the CIA, and therefore that's why we had the Patriot Act. And... Uh, that really, really troubles mm. me that no one is questioning um, that element of it or, or apparently seems to be uh, questioning that element. And I, I guess I'd like a comment on that. All right. Thanks very much for that question. And, Paula, I don't know, you're the one that brought up the Patriot Act in the first place, which was very smart of you. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, you know, it, it's something that I have concerns over. Mm. I mean, there was an emergence of a Patriot two somewhere around actually September 11th of uh, last mm-hmm. year. Um, when I was in New York, there was some talk about that. Uh, it stopped. I haven't heard any talk, but I, I'm not, you know, like a, a, a media, well, certain media outlets, but I'm not really well versed in what mm-hmm. everybody's saying. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's a really important question. I mean, how much, how much freedom are we willing to give up for how much security? And uh, I, you know, I'm back to my fundamental, what's a fundamental point to me, that a notion of absolute security is ridiculous. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, now, what am I willing to give up? Am I willing to let them, you know, investigate my records? Uh, I don't think, so. you know, I, I don't know. I need to hear 
far more discussion about it. Did it facilitate communication between all those alphabet city, uh, you know, agencies? God, I hope so, because a lot of it sounds like one end didn't know what the other end was doing. And what about you, Walter Fields? Well, I think I think one of the reasons the caller mentioned, you know, why why is the discussion so narrowly focused? Mm. I think the problem is we're we're looking at it through the prism of a commission that mm. was constructed to examine this event, nine uh, eleven. Mm. I think there's a larger issue that needs to be addressed, and that is a wider scope inquiry. Um, on this administration. And one of the problems is that, you know, we're lacking the device that Republicans use so effectively against the, the, the Clinton administration, special counsels, you know, to be able to launch investigations. And the fact that we have a Republican controlled Congress doesn't help either. So the frustration here is that you can't get at those deeper, you know, issues because of the political resistance on Capitol Hill. But clearly we need to go beyond 9-11 because there is also an issue that has, hasn't been raised in any of these hearings. The fact that this administration arrived at the White House with a preconceived notion of how it wanted to realign that region of the world mm. that grew out of think tanks, the Project for a New American Century. You know, people like uh, Paul Wolfowitz and Rums, all of these folks had been mm. deliberating for years about how that region could be re realigned under a Republican presidential administration. So there was this sort of almost preconceived notion that no matter what was going on in the world, we were going to realign that region of the world. We were going to go into Iraq, and we were going to remove Saddam Hussein for a number of reasons, and that we haven't gotten to. Mm -hmm. in an investigative sense. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to go to another caller. I thank you very much, uh, Red. Ed in Richmond, welcome to Living Room. Thank you. I have a few points I want to make about, about my sister right there. I think, uh, first of all, as far as being a very powerful woman, I don't see her as being very powerful because mm -hmm. if she had any type of power, um, she would have been able to answer more definitively some of those questions that were presented to her this morning. So for a woman with power, it seemed like she didn't know nothing or no one confided to her. So I don't see her as a woman with power. I basically see her as a pawn in the scheme of things, very able to be manipulated and, and, and readily to be sacrificed. I'm really disappointed. But then again, you look at the American government, you know, they really don't want no one of color to really be in that power position. So I do understand the whole scheme of things. So that was just a point I wanted to make today. All right. I thank you very kindly. We're going to go to Mary in Richmond. This may be our last caller this morning. Good afternoon. Welcome. Hi. Um, this may sound naive and ignorant, but what I don't get <laughs> is how it is that she can be allowed to testify before a commission without being under oath and um, why we expect her to tell the truth if she isn't under oath. I mean, obviously there's some reason why she didn't want to be under oath. It means she doesn't want to tell the truth, right? Well, well she did She did go under oath this morning. Yeah, she raised her hand and she, took she the did. pledge, yeah. Oh, great. Okay, see, I was ignorant. All right, no, thank I, you. It was easy to, if you didn't see the very beginning, it was so quick. You know, they don't, it's not anything really formal. They raise their right hand, blah, 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 and it's over. But that does put them under oath. So her statement is now under oath, and conceivably, if they went back and find, find contradictory statements from what she said publicly and what she said privately, you know, issues of whether she perjured herself do, do mm -hmm. become relevant. But mm -hmm. she, is, she was under oath today. Okay, one last caller, Antonio in San Leandro. Welcome to the living room. Hi. Yeah, um, what I want to say is that as much of a snake that uh, Condoleezza Rice is, she's way more intelligent than the politically correct tra crowd. Uh, this political correct crowd refused to give credit to the foreign anti-imperialist fighters who are smarting the arrogant Yankees. And th all this is is just mm. a campaign to elect uh, Vietnam War criminal John Kerry, who won a lot of medals for killing Vietnamese people. All right. Well, I thank you for that comment. Uh, any response from from well, you, Paulo, or from Walter? You start. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I think I think number one, I've never doubted the fact that Condoleezza Rice is intelligent. Right. Um, the the question becomes, where do you stand ethically and morally? We have a lot of very intelligent people who are very unethical. Um, so that's my position regarding Dr. Rice. Number two, you know, regarding you know Senator Kerry, he is going to have to stand on his own 
to get elected. And he's going to have to convince the American public that he is prepared to deal with this issue um, in a much more, you know, consistent and efficient manner um, and a much more, I think, comprehensive manner than the current administration. So, you know, I personally... Um, and not defending John Kerry or, or publicly in supporting John Kerry. I want to see what John Kerry has to say about how he's going to resolve this issue and also how he's going to get us the hell out of Iraq. Amen. Walter Fields, the CEO and publisher of the North Star Network. You can go to www.thenorthstarnetwork.com to read his uh, work, his writing. And I thank you, sir, so very much for joining us today, and I hope this won't be the last time. Well, I thank you very much, and, and I really do. You know, we extend our sympathies to all the families who have been affected because we can't forget them. It's, it was a tragic event, and hopefully none of us will ever see anything like this again in our lifetime.